सहनावतु सहनो भनक्त सह वीरवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिद्विषावह ओ शाशा परमते निरुद्धम योग सेवया पश्यन्नात्मनि तुष्यते सुखमात्यंत्रिक्रिय वेत्ति स्थितचलति तत्वतःलब्ध्वा चापर लाभ दुखेन गुरुणा विचाल्य तम विद्या दुख संयोग वियोगम योग संगत सनिश्चयन योक्तव्य योगो निर्वीण चेत सरमते चिंता चिंतम द माइंड उपरमते बिकम्स विड्रॉन इन द सेल्फ योग सेवया on account of a long practice of resolving the mind into one's own self yatra jiva atmana atmanam pashyan atmani tushyati where one sees oneself by oneself meaning where one recognizes one's true nature in one's own self tushyati and finds a complete satisfaction or a complete contentment with oneself <coughs> So here, Lord Krishna is saying that it is necessary that we should also practice resolving the mind into our own self. As we discussed in the morning, recognizing that the self or the consciousness is the true nature of the mind, is the true nature of what we call ego, and therefore it is going back to our own nature. that is where the real happiness is to be found because the self or consciousness which is limitless alone is of the nature of happiness nothing else can be happiness at all yo vai bhuma tat sukham nalpe sukham asti hey that which is limitless that alone is happiness there can be no happiness in anything that is limited so by the practice that has been stated so far how a person's and again lord krishna will again describe it further describe it again in short as to how to do that but this is a practice of resolving the mind meaning resolving the ego into one's own self like a wave going back to its nature namely water or an ornament going back to its nature namely gold all that is basically required is for the wave to give up the notion that i am a wave meaning that i am a name and form and recognize and see this fact constantly that i am water which is a fact is not that the wave has to become water but then that the wave is water 
Not that the ego has to become the self of the consciousness, that I am consciousness. It is that consciousness self alone think that I am the ego. It is water that thinks that I am wave, really. There is no such entity as wave independent of water. It's water when it is identified with a given name and form that the water entertains the notion that I am a whale. And so also Atma or the Self in identification with one name and form, the one body, one and complex, entertains the notion that I am an ego or I am an individual, limited in being. And so this meditation has a lot of backing of the teaching. And they say that, as Lord Krishna said also, that brahmachari vrata sthitaha, one who is uh, steadily abiding in the vrata or the vow of brahmachari, meaning being a student of Vedanta. That means that a lot of shravanam listening and manam has gone behind this. And therefore, there is an understanding on the part of, part of this meditator. It is not that he comes across the self as a result of this process of meditation. He knows that self or consciousness is my nature and this meditation is primarily to own up what I know. As I said, because there is a habit of identifying with the body-mind and therefore feeling limited. Therefore, here the attempt is to reverse that whole process and I know that consciousness is my nature, it is to own up that, own up that knowledge is the purpose of this meditation. Which is same, of course, as the meditation that anybody performs. The yogi also goes through the same steps. Therefore, this process is also called yoga. Except that, perhaps a yogi is seeking some kind of an experience, whereas a Vedantin is not seeking an experience. He proceeds with the knowledge. So, Vedanta does not ask the question, who am I, really? Vedanta understands the statement, I am Brahman. Because Upanishad says, you are Brahman, the question is not, who am I? That I am Brahman, how I am Brahman? This is what Shravanam or the listening to scripture does. It unfolds the statement that you are Brahman by making me recognize that I am not this body or the mind, etc., which I take myself, them myself to be. That I am, as you say in the morning, I am not the body with consciousness, I am the consciousness with the body. I am the consciousness with the mind. I am the consciousness self having this body-mind complex. I am not the body-mind complex having consciousness. <clears throat> so this clarity is there. And with that clarity one performs the meditation of letting go of the identifications. And this identification being very strong or habitual therefore, Yes, it does require a lot of practice. Therefore, yoga sevaya as a result of practice of this yoga or giving the identification and shifting the identification to myself which is consciousness with the self. <coughs> Chittam niruddham when the mind meaning the duality becomes completely stopped. That is, the thing, the thought that I am a limited being, that thought is no more there because that thought has been resolved. Yatra Seva Atmana Atmanam Pashyan where seeing oneself by oneself. Because seeing myself is not, not like seeing a pot or a cloth or something different from me. So seeing a flower, for example, involves the say in the morning a duality between the seer and the seen. And therefore I see a flower through the eyes, through the mind. I require eyes or organ of perception in the mind to be able to see the flower or perceive the flower. However, I don't require organ of perception to perceive myself because I am the perceiver. Nor do I require a mind also to objectify myself. In order to see the flower or perceive the flower, I need to objectify the flower and for that I use my organ of perception such as I and with the mind I objective like a flower, I know the flower is an object different from myself. In that knowledge, the duality of the knower known is involved. This is how ordinarily the knowledge of perception is. But then, that is not the way that I see myself. Because the seer is my own self, therefore, 
I don't need to objectify myself. I do not see myself as someone, you know, as I see a flower or that I see some name and form or some, some a light or something like that because whatever I see or perceive is going to be different from myself. So understand that this seeing does not involve the duality of the knower known. Then whether the very duality itself has to drop. The very duality of the knower, that means that the very role of the knower also has to drop. So here it is not that I retain my status as a knower, which I need to do in case of object, I mean knowledge of any other object. I need to retain my status of knower, then alone I can know the flower or anything like that. But in case of the self, I in fact, the very status of knower itself is dropped. And therefore, because Atma the self is self-refulgent, self-shining and therefore, you do not require any sense organs of mind to limit the self. So Lord Krishna says, Atmana Atmanam Atmani Pashyantu Shari Seeing oneself by oneself in oneself. In recognizing that, Consciousness or limitlessness is my nature. To shari, one gains a complete satisfaction or a complete contentment with oneself. And that happiness, Lord Krishna described in verse 21, sukham atyantikam. That sukha or happiness is atyantikam, meaning it is no end, it is no limit. Because it is the happiness which is the self, which is limitless. Atyantikam. It is atindira meaning not the happiness generated by the experience of a sense object. So normally the happiness that we experience is of a sense object such as a flower. And so when I perceive or appreciate an object such as flower and enjoy it, that is a pleasure or happiness born of that. That is called the happiness born of the object of perception and born through the agency of the organ of perception in the mind. Here on the other hand, this is happiness which is myself. It is self-effulgent, self-revealing. And therefore, I do not need any organ of perception. I do not need mind also as a separate entity in order for me to know. It is not an experience in the sense that I am experiencing something different by myself. It is becoming that. So here, the very knower, the meditator, becomes that happiness. Like the wave just becomes the water. In the knowledge that I am water, it's not in the wave can completely resolve also the name and form and become the water and recognize that I am water. And so also, here this knower, or the meditator, drops the name and form, and ever its content itself is consciousness. This is what he, he becomes, or this is what he remains. And therefore, he remains of the nature of happiness. This happiness is not born of an experience, not born of sense organ or mind. It is what is already existing. And that final obstacle of the sense of retaining my status as an experiencer was the final obstacle to the manifestation of happiness. When that experiencer also is no more, then there is nothing to restrain the manifestation of the happiness. Therefore, Atyantikam Sukham, meaning he sees himself. I see myself as the Sukham or happiness which is limitless. Atyindriyam, not born of an experience, not born of an experience of a sense pleasure, because the happiness which is born is also going to come to an end. This is not born, this Swabhavikam, something that is inherent, something that is natural, which is, as we say, always there. Like the sun is shining, the clouds are only concealing the sun, and when the clouds completely go away, how the sun becomes manifest, and so also the self becomes manifest in its true nature when all the clouds, the final cloud being my status of being an experiencer. When that cloud also goes, then all that remains is me, which is nothing but the happiness or happiness accompanied with consciousness because this is conscious happiness or happy consciousness. It is existence which is self-revealing or consciousness that is self-existing and self-sufficient. So self-existing, self-revealing, self-sufficient, I am. This is the 
This is how I see myself. Therefore, Atmani Pashan Pushari. Therefore, this knower or this aspirant is completely satisfied seeing himself as nothing but self-existing, ever natural, uncreated happiness. <coughs> call it happiness, call it fullness. So, Atyantikam Sukham Buddhi Grahyam. So, this Lord Krishna says Buddhi Grahyam, meaning that which is known, about which I am conscious. To distinguish it from the deep sleep, where also a similar situation exists. In the deep sleep also, the duality of the knower known is not there, and therefore, there is also supposedly an experience of happiness. Except that, that time the buddhi, the consciousness is not there, and therefore, Lord Krishna says, buddhi grahyam. That means that, the here, the meditator, or the yogi, or the, the enlightened person, is aware. In the deep sleep state, I am not aware. Here, I am aware. So, buddhi meaning, the sattvic vritti is there, which does not retain its separate existence, but then awareness is there. <coughs> so, this happiness is sukham, is here, Lord Krishna uses three adjectives for that, atyantikam, atindriyam, and buddhi grahyam. Atyantikam, which has no end, which has no limit, which is nothing but Brahman. Atindriyam, he is not born, it is something that is natural, uncreated, and therefore also unending. Buddhi grahyam, that there is consciousness, not that I become unconscious, and I do not know, Although the knower known difference is not there, and still there is the happiness, as we said, Atma is consciousness, at the same time existence, same same time self-sufficient, and therefore there is an awareness of my being limitless, awareness of my being completely content, and awareness of my being consciousness, this is very much there. Yatra Seva Ayam Sthitaha Yatra Sthitaha Abiding where I am tattvataha nachalati, gaining abidance in which, which is my own self, then one does not get deviated from that. <coughs> so question is, Swamiji, even after gaining an abidance then, what when you come out of the samadhi, etc., but then this is not an experience from which you come out, this is a recognition. And once the recognition is there of the reality, there is no question of coming out, etc. If this was something created as a result of some effort, then when the effort goes away, the thing also goes away. This is not created, that's what atindriyam, not created, which is always there. But then I was not disposed to appreciate that. When I am totally disposed to appreciate myself, and I recognize that this happiness or fullness is my nature, then there is no question of it is going away because that is what my nature is. Like as we say, when an ornament recognizes I am gold, then it doesn't matter that it will never go away. Ornament need not meditate all the time that I am gold once there is a firm recognition of that fact. The meditation may, is needed as long as there is a tendency on the part of ornament to still look upon itself as an ornament. So long the meditation is needed to become free from that natural ident habitual identification. But once it is gone, then no effort is needed because this is what I am. And therefore, yatra sthitaha, abiding where I am, tattvata hanachalati, this one, the enlightened person, does not get deviated from his own nature. <coughs> Which is in fact what is described in the next verse, Verse 22, let us read that again. Yam labdhva cha param labham Manyate nadhikam tataha Yasmim sthito na dukkhena Guruna pi vichalyate. Yam labdhva. Gaining which? Achieving which? 
न अपरम लाभम मन्यते अधिकम ततः वन रिकग्नाइज दैट देर इज नो गेन ग्रेटर देन दिस दिस इज ऑल्सो ए रियलाइजेशन और रिकग्निशन सो सींग माई सेल्फ एज बाउंडलेस सींग माई सेल्फ एज लिमिटलेस दर इज ऑल्सो नेचुरली रेकग्निशन इन वो दैट दर इज नथिंग ग्रेटर देन दिस द आइडिया इज दैट नो सेंस ऑफ लैक और वॉन्ट रिमेन्स इन एनी अदर एक्सपीरियंस दर इज ऑलवेज अ सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ डिससेटिस्फेक्शन इन वो बिकॉज रिगार्डलेस ऑफ वट आई एम एक्सपीरियंसिंग रिगार्डलेस ऑफ वट एवर हैपीनेस आई हैव ऑलवेज इन अवेयरनेस इट कुड बी बेटर दैट अवेयरनेस दैट दिस कुड बी बेटर इवन दो unless i get completely lost in an experience so sometimes it happens that in an ecstatic experience i'll get lost completely meaning that at that time at that moment i do not remain as an individual but otherwise you know like experience of happiness where i'm aware that i'm an experiencer there's also a certain amount of awareness that this could be better for the simple reason that in experience of any amount of happiness the experiencer who is a limited entity remains and therefore as i cannot become free from a sense of limitation regardless of what experience it is and as long as there is there is the awareness of limitation so long there is always this thought that it could be better here lord krishna says that yam labdha gaining it अपरम लाभम अधिकम न मनते नाउ ही नोज दर इज नथिंग ग्रेटर देन दिस बिकॉज देर इज नो सेंस ऑफ लैक और वॉन्ट एनी मोर रिमेनिंग बिकॉज इवन द एक्सपीरियंस एस सच ऑल्सो डज नॉट रिमेन एंड एफर वन बिकम्स कंप्लीटली फ्री फ्रॉम एनी सेंस ऑफ लिमिटेशन एंड लैक एंड वॉन्ट इन दैट इज वॉट इज मैंड बाय सेंग दैट गेनिंग विच वन नोज दैट देर इज नथिंग ग्रेटर इन दिस and tatvatah na chalati abiding in which one never gets deviated from this truth or never gets deviated from oneself so here lord krishna explains that yasmim sthitah na dukhena guru na api vichalyate abiding in which one does not get deviated one does not get shaken up even by the greatest of the pain guru na here guru doesn't mean guru in terms of teacher here the word guru is neuter gender so what guru is in two genders masculine gender and neuter gender in masculine gender guru means a teacher in neuter gender guru means heavy you know heavy or big so guru na dukhya na by heavy meaning by great and happiness also by great sorrow also meaning that if something happens with reference to this enlightened person which can normally be understood as very sorrowful if such a thing happens an ordinary person naturally becomes shaken up by by anything that is sorrowful or any, there is a great loss for example so if there is a great loss there is a great calamity something very very unforeseen or unexpected happens something very painful happens or what can normally be called painful but that also does not in fact deter or deviate this person from abidance in his nature because in his view there is no such thing as sorrow and this is sorrow really is not an event sorrow is my reaction to an event there is no event that can be called sorrow it is my reaction to an event which is sorrow because for the same event different people sometimes react differently or i also react differently to same event at different times depending on how my mood is so when is sorrow sorrow is when i judge that i am limited i am bound i am helpless i am inadequate if an experience somehow brings about my inadequacy in some way or the other 
it is my inadequacy which really causes sorrow in me and no event there. An event when it creates sorrow, it only triggers my existing sense of inadequacy. That I am inadequate is a, a current of thought which is there at the basis of everything. And when an event brings out that sense of inadequacy, that is when I feel sorrowful. And more inadequate I feel, more sorrowful I am, more helpless I feel. More inadequate I feel, more helpless I feel, more sad or sorrowful I am. But when one has recognized that, really limitlessness is my nature, happiness is my, fullness is my nature, then it is not subject to coming and going, because fullness with itself is not because of some reason. If what is wave is water is not because of some reason, because that is what it is. Or if I am Brahman or I am limitless, is not because of something, it is my nature. Just as fire is hot, not because of some reason, because to be hot is nature of fire. And so also that I am Brahman or I am limitless or I am whole or complete being is not because of something, it is my nature. So far, maybe the recognition was not there. Even if recognition was there, an abidance was not there. But when now, I abide in this knowledge that I am whole, I am complete, there is nothing, in, but then, there is nothing that can make me feel incomplete because I am complete not because of something. If my completeness was on account of the fact that everything was convenient, I mean everything was as I wanted, then of course that can go away. But here, I know that I'm a complete being because that is my nature, regardless of what the outer outside configuration is. It's not something out there which has made me complete. Completeness or wholeness is my nature. In as much as the, the wholeness is not created by something, it cannot be taken away by something also. If all of you being here makes me feel good, then if you are not here, it will make me feel bad. My feeling good, if it is due to something, when that cause goes away, the feeling good also goes away. My feeling happy is because of some reason. Because the evening is serving pizza, I am happy. Okay. If I discover that is not the case, or is not something that I can eat, I can become unhappy. Oh, there is onion in there, this is garlic in there, this is onion. Forget it. Okay. Or Swami is ice cream this evening, okay, the thought of it makes me happy. Then I discover, I don't care for this ice cream, you know, it's all kinds of nuts, I'm allergic to that. So, if happiness or satisfaction or contentment was due to some reason, then that contentment will go away when the reason also goes away. But that I am content, contentment is my nature. Satisfaction by nature, self-sufficiency by nature. I am self-sufficient by nature, not because of something. In spite of everything, in fact nothing else has changed, the body remains as limited as before. Whatever problems it has, they continue to remain. The mind also remains as limited as before, in terms of its memory, in terms of whatever it is. Thus, my personality remains as limited as before. The world also essentially remains as it was before. Only thing that has changed now is my perception. My perception about myself has changed, and therefore my perception about the world also changes. When my perception is that I am self-sufficient by myself, then I know that Nothing in the world can either give me sufficiency or take away sufficiency. As Lord Krishna described in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, describing a wise person, comparing him to an ocean as to how ocean abides in its own fullness. Ocean is not full because rivers bring water into ocean, or because the clouds rain water, the ocean's fullness is not because of something. 
If the fullness of ocean was because rivers were bringing water to that, then ocean will become reduced or become lacking if the rivers don't bring water. But in as much as fullness of ocean is independent. Therefore, if the waters bring, rivers bring the water, it's fine. If they do not bring the water, then also it's fine. Similarly to a wise person was compared to an ocean. And therefore, if my fullness is on account of something, it can also be snatched away from me. But it is not on account of something. Neither something can make me more full than what I am, nor something can reduce in my fullness. Meaning that my fullness is independent of anything around me or anything outside of me or anything other than me. Therefore, whether what is outside of me is one way or the other is immaterial to me. In that sense, Lord Krishna says that Guru Napi, even by what may be normally considered a great calamity in the normal sense, that also does not in any way create in this person a sense of lack because his sense of fullness is not because of any event or lack of event, is only because of himself. Yasmin Sthitaha, abiding in which? Guruna Bidukhena, even by a great sorrow also, Navichalyate, the person is not deviated, is not shaken up. <coughs> and so, Navichalyate, he is not shaken up. <coughs> This is explanation of the previous verse. Because in previous verse, Lord Krishna said, Sukham Atyantikam. This Sukha or happiness that the wise person sees himself as. Don't say the wise person experiences that Sukha. The wise person sees himself as that Sukha. Is Atyantikam, which, is, which means that it is, it, it, it is no anta. It is free from all the limits. And that was explained as yam labdhva cha param labham manyate nadigam tataha. That the happiness is limitless was explained by saying that seeing oneself as happiness, then he knows that there is no gain that is greater than this. Which is meant, which is, which means that the happiness is limitless. And also vityatran sevayam sthitas sarati tattvataha. Abiding in which one does not get deviated or affected, that is explained by saying that Yasmim Sthitaha, abiding in which Guru Napi Dukhena Vichalyate, one does not get affected even by very pain, what can be normally considered a very painful situation. <coughs> if Dukkha is interpreted as physical pain, Dukkha means pain, Dukkha can mean sorrow, Dukkha also can mean physical pain. Then you can say this description of a yogi abiding in his, firmly abiding in himself, that any kind of physical pain also does not deviate him. But then, rather than saying that, it's better to say that Dukkha here means sorrow. Or what is generally considered sorrow by, or what we would consider sorrow. So we would say, oh look at him, what he has to go through. For an enlightened person, we say, what he used to go through? Look at this, how sad. <laughs> From what standpoint? From the standpoint of onlookers. Because if similar thing happened to me, I would have been very sad. But that person is not sad because he does not judge himself based on what is around. As long as I judge myself based on what is around me, so long I'm always subject to being affected. If my happiness or sense of well-being is on account of things which are conducive in my opinion, then sense of well-being and comfort will go away, when that is not so. As you say, so hear that, my well-being is not on account of something, because to be well is my nature. My comfort or self-sufficiency is not on account of something, it is my nature. That being, and nature has no reason to be. It is nature. Nature is something that cannot be changed. Fire is hot regardless of where it is. And nobody can take away heat from fire because that's the nature of fire. And so also, 
that consciousness or limitless is my nature, it cannot be denied. So when this fact is recognized, and when one abides in this recognition, then there is nothing, no sorrow that can touch this person. Again similar to what I've said in the case of Sita Pragya, Atmaneva Atmana Tushtaha, one who is totally content with oneself by oneself. And describing that, Lord Krishna said there, Dukkeshu Anudvignamanaha Sukheshu Vigatasprohaha. One who does not get perturbed in what is normally considered a painful situation and whose mind does not long in what is considered a pleasant situation. Not because insensitive, because he is estimated of himself or his hopefulness is not dependent upon external situation. <clears throat> this is the description of the knowledge. In fact, we can say that these verses describe the knowledge of an enlightened person. And it is true that to gain an abidance in knowledge, practice is needed because there is a habitual error of taking myself to be a limited being. And to overcome that error, habitual error, it is necessary to keep on asserting again and again that I am Brahman or I am limitless. <clears throat> and, the, and the sentence is completed in the verse 23. Let us read that again. Tam vidya dukkha sanyoga vyogam yoga sanyitam Tam vidya dukkha sanyoga vyogam yoga sanyitam Sanischayena yogta vyaha Sanischayena yogta vyaha Yogo nirvinna chetasa Yogo nirvinna chetasa Lord Krishna says Tam yogi sanyitam vidyat I do understand that this is yoga. Very interesting or a very interesting definition or unusual definition of yoga is being given here. Dukkha sanyoga vyoga. Dukkha means sorrow. Sanyoga means union. Vyoga means disunion. Sanyoga means association and Vyoga means disassociation. Sri Arjuna recognizes Yoga. Yoga, yoga generally means union. That is why people understand Yoga as union of Atma with Paramatma. That's what they say. The Atma gets united with Paramatma. This is what everybody thinks. And so after listening to Vedanta, even for many years, people still ask this question. How does Atma become united? How big Atma becomes Paramatma? How does it become united? Because some of the ideas are there. The idea that I'm a spark of consciousness, that also doesn't go, you know. That I'm part of God, that also does not go. Somehow, some of these things are embedded, you know, in our, in our mindset and therefore, those things remain intact. Somehow, listening to Vedanta also does not seem to change of these things. But then, here, it is not that, so let Lord Krishna clarifies. Yoga, you, the word yuj, yoga is made from the root yuj, which is in the sense of yoking, or in the sense of joining. Therefore, the word yoga would generally mean that there is some kind of a joining involved. So you might think that Atma is joining with happiness. Atma is joining with happiness. I am joining with happiness. That is yoga. That right now I am separated from happiness because I am unhappy. And by this process I become united with happiness. And therefore union with happiness would be called yoga. Lord Krishna says no. It is not union with happiness. In fact, a yoga or union 
already exists in our life right now. Even when we are born, we are already united with something. Without Dukkha Sanyoga, the human being is already united with sorrow. Right from the birth. Therefore, we are born united with sorrow. How is that? If you understand what it is that causes sorrow, then we can understand how we are united with sorrow. As I said, the only reason that I feel sorrow, sad or sorrowful, is, as I said, whenever I perceive myself as a lacking or wanting being, when I perceive myself as an inadequate being, when I perceive myself as a helpless being, because I do not control everything and I find therefore that what I want does not happen, what I do not want happens. And then again and again I find myself powerless in, 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 in the life also. Or even if those things are not there still, whenever I think of myself, I see myself as a limited being. I see myself as an ignorant being. I see myself as a mortal being. I see myself as subject to being sadness or sorrow. This is how, this is my perception of myself from the birth. It is this perception which is the cause of sorrow. Nothing else. There is no other cause of sorrow. There can be physical pain that is due to prarabdha. But sorrow is the emotional pain that we are talking about. Samsara is not so much the physical pain. Samsara is primarily the emotional pain. The emotional pain of finding myself as inadequate, wanting, lacking. I wish I had such and such thing, then I would be alright. I wish I had a million dollars, I would have been okay. I wish I had such and such job, I would have been alright. I wish I had such and such relationship, I will be alright. Whatever. So without that relationship, I am inadequate. Without that money, I am inadequate. Without that job, I am inadequate. Without whatever, there are millions of reasons for me to feel inadequate. You keep on making me adequate by fulfilling my desire, my mind will come up with new things anyway. See, Swami, all right, we want to make you happy. You want a million dollars? Here they are. You want a big house? Here it is. Or you want a new flashy car? Here it is. You want what? Give everything. Whatever the mind keeps on desiring, keep on giving. But the mind is very creative in this also. You come with new inadequacy in some way. But I have all of but that I don't have. This everything I have, but this still this I don't have. And therefore, under any conditions, when my desire is fulfilled, for a while I feel adequate. Again, the sense of inadequacy takes hold of my mind. So Lord Krishna says that human being is united with sorrow. Dukkha Sanyoga. So what do we need to do in our life? Is this union or this association. The union with sorrow is there. In fact, we will bring about a separation or disassociation. So life is not really, doesn't have to become a process of acquiring happiness, it should become a process of getting rid of unhappiness. That's what we're doing, Swamiji. No, but then we should understand what causes unhappiness. What causes unhappiness or sorrow is of course a sense of inadequacy. What causes sense of inadequacy? Do I feel inadequate or incomplete because incompleteness is the nature? Is that why I feel it? If really the self or I is inadequate by nature, incomplete by nature, mortal by nature, uh, ignorant by nature, if this was my nature, and if I felt, that is okay. But then the thing is that, what is my nature would never create a revulsion in me, I would always be comfortable with my nature. As you say, fire is always comfortable being hot, no problem. Similarly, if incompleteness, inadequacy were by nature, I would have had no problem with it. 
The fact that I cannot accept that incompleteness, inadequacy, means that it is not my nature. It is my perception of myself, not the nature of myself. I am born with this perception. Why is it so? Because I do not know the true nature of myself. Not only that, not only I do not know the true nature of the self, but at the same time, I take as self what is not self. This body, which is not myself, is habitually taken to be the self without anybody telling me. This education I did not need. My mother did not have to tell me, hey, this is you, this body is you. I know it. I don't need to be told. By body we also include the gross body, subtle body, the mind, sense organs, the whole thing is I. Thus, not only I do not know the true nature of myself, but what is not self is taken to be self. This is the habitual thing with which we are born. This habitual perception with which we are born. And thus, that's all that is enough. I'm already united with sorrow. Because when I take the body to be myself, then naturally I will think that I'm a mortal being. Then the, the death, I find that I am now subject to death. And that is something I resist. I don't like that. I can't accept it. When the body, mind is myself, then I'm a limited being. And that also I don't accept. Thus, I simply do not accept myself as I find myself to be. And therefore, there is a tremendous conflict within myself. There is in fact a non-acceptance of my own self, which is what causes that conflict, which is the cause of sorrow. Therefore, life should become a process of becoming acceptable to ourselves. So, as you understand, this yoga is not the yoga in sense of being united with something that you are not. This yoga is being disassociated with something that you are not. It is disassociation from a sense of smallness or inadequacy. And how that comes? Because of taking the body-mind complex as myself. Therefore, creating a distance. Where distance exists, because of ignorance, the two things are lumped together. Where there are two, there is this delusion of taking it as one. So there are two. This body-mind complex is what we call the personality, and I am the person, the conscious self. But then not recognizing these two as two, I take them to be one. Therefore, I take myself to be a conscious being, which is limited by this body-mind complex, confined to this body-mind complex. I know that I am a conscious being, that I know. But then, I know myself as a conscious being, confined to this body-mind complex. Therefore, the sense of confinement never goes. Therefore, the sense of being separated from everything else never goes. There was a sense of not being insignificant never goes. And therefore, my attempt why am I trying to please everybody? So the separation I am feeling, you know, if everybody accepts me and everybody loves me, then at least I am trying to eliminate the distance I am feeling. This sense of exclusion or separation I am feeling, I am trying to remove that. Why? Always keeping everybody in good mood so that they will accept me, they will be pleased with me and they will love me and they will accept me. If you understand what all we are doing, you will find that it, all our attempts arise from our perception of ourselves, the false perception of ourselves. I'm not suggesting that you don't please other people. That's not the point. That we should displease them. No, that's not the point. Make others happy if you can. You cannot do that, but you can try always. Not that I'm happy only when my efforts are successful. That's all. It's a good idea to, to try to make other people happy. As long as my happiness does not depend upon my being able to make them happy. You follow what I'm saying? Because when I fail to make them happy, I become unhappy. Lord Krishna says, accept the result of the action gracefully. 
But anyway, the point is that this disassociation from the identification with the body-mind complex, which arising, arises from ignorance of not knowing my true nature, is called dukkha, I mean this is dukkha sanyoga, it is a sanyoga or association or union with dukkha or sorrow. Vyogam, what we need to do in our life is vyoga, a separation or disassociation from this association with sorrow. That is called yoga. So therefore, Lord Krishna is giving a negative definition of yoga. Says Sankarajara, the vipari the lakshana in avidya. Vipari the lakshana means negative definition. Yoga should actually mean joining. But Lord Krishna says, it is disassociation with yoga. Because you are born a yogi. You, you are born a yogi, meaning you are born joined with sorrow. And therefore become vyogi. Or therefore become disassociated with sorrow. Which of course we are trying to do. But not the way it should be done. In fact what needs to happen is a change in our perception of ourselves. The thing needs to happen. What needs to happen in our life is a change of my perception about myself. Therefore we say, live a life such that it progressively creates a better and better perception of myself or it progressively results into a greater and greater acceptance of myself. Therefore, first step of this yoga, first step of disassociating with pain is called karma yoga. Even living life of karma yoga, where my actions are performed for the sake of serving others. My actions are performed for the, as a, in the spirit of offering myself to the world or to, to Ishwara. They are also, or performing actions in keeping with the values of life, whenever I am able to do that. As I said, whenever I can do a little thing for somebody, I feel good about myself. Whenever I am able to be honest or truthful, I feel good about myself. And therefore, rather than making the life a process of acquiring some sensuous gratification, make the life a process of feeling good about the self. Because then there is more and more acceptance of myself, more and more comfort with myself. Thus, Karma Yoga, living life of Dharma, living life of values, living life of other-centeredness, living life as much as selfless as we can, not gratifying the ego, not gratifying my likes and dislikes, rather than be always in making an effort to let go of the likes and dislikes. Satisfying likes and dislikes is nothing but again joining with sorrow. Therefore, not satisfying likes and dislikes, perform an action so that likes and dislikes go away. So an ignorant person performs his action to satisfy his likes and dislikes, whereas an intelligent person performs actions to get rid of likes and dislikes. It's a big process. Likes and dislikes itself shows association with sorrow. So, if I, if I satisfy my likes and dislikes, means that I'm only enhancing my association with sorrow. If I am in the process, if I have value for becoming free from likes and dislikes, becoming free from these impulses, as Duryodhana says, I'm helpless. Duryodhana could not manage himself. Jana mi dharmam, nacheme pravruttihi. I know what is right, I cannot do that. Jana mi dharmam, nacheme nivrutti. I know what is wrong, I cannot avoid it. Kena api devena, rudisthitena, yatha niyuktosmi, tatha karami. There is some deva or a demon sitting in my heart which compels me to be, act the way I am doing. Helpless. Recognizing that these attachment and aversions or likes and dislikes make me helpless. And therefore, first level of freedom 
And therefore, the first level of dissociation with sorrow is becoming free from the hold of likes and dislikes, becoming free from the hold of our inner impulses. And likes and dislikes include anger and greed and jealousy and all these negative feelings which disturb my mind, which in fact make my mind completely agitated. <clears throat> so, Karma Yoga becomes the first level of Yoga. That's why it's called Yoga. In Karma Yoga also, there is disassociation from the association with pain. So, what does Karma Yoga aim at? Karma Yoga aims at making me essentially free from my likes and dislikes, free from those inner negative impulses, and thus gives me the first level of freedom from the association with sorrow. Then comes the second level of freedom, and that is the knowledge of the self. The second level, where the ignorance, which is the ultimate cause, that goes away. So first is removal of likes and dislikes because that kind of frame of mind is required. Lord Krishna called it Yoga Rudhatva. Yoga Rudha means a person who has gained the capacity to be able to focus one's mind upon oneself. One has gained, so by removal of these likes and dislikes or removal of these impulses, one has gained a mind which is abiding mind, which mind is available to oneself. With the mind, with which mind one can really contemplate upon one's own self. And then with the help of teaching, of course, the second level of association with dukkha, which is ignorance, there also goes. And then what Lord Krishna described in earlier three verses is what happens, namely, an abidance in my own self. Therefore, gaining an abidance in the true nature of myself is the ultimate in the disassociation with the association from sorrow. So here Arjuna, know this, that you are not getting united with something other than you. You are not getting associated with something other than you. This is a process of owning yourself up. It is recognizing and owning what you already are. You are not being given something that is something else or something new or something different. This is nothing but just being you. Right now you are not you. Then, you know, when you, the water thinks that I am just a wave, it is not itself. Only when you know that I am water, then alone it is true self. And so also this consciousness thing that I am ego, that is not I. Just be yourself. That is what Vedanta teaches and therefore Recognize the true nature and remain what you are. That is called the yoga. Meaning, recognizing myself and owning up myself is the yoga that Lord Krishna talks about or that Vedanta talks about. Sanishena yoktavya And as you understand, there is no choice. There is no other way of really becoming free from sorrow. There is no other way of discovering happiness which you are seeking. There is no other way of fulfilling the goal of life. Let this nitya, let this kind of uh, ascertainment, this kind of conviction come into you. So first of all, it should begin with conviction, which conviction comes as a result of exposure to teaching. Vedanta Vijnana Sunishchita Arthaha. As the Upanishad says, that those who are Sunishchita Arthaha, those people who have a very, uh, who have developed a strong conviction about the Vijnanam, about the knowledge that Vedanta gives, namely, I am Brahman. So first that conviction comes and then the, the realization or actual, actual becoming comes. <clears throat> because I cannot take to a path, any path, unless I have a conviction that this is what I want to do and that this in fact leads me or will lead me to the goal that I am seeking. And so one cannot take to this path. This path is what? It's nothing but letting go. That's all. Things that I am holding on to, first of likes and dislikes and various notions about myself, just letting them go. 
But what happens is, I think that I become, I will become insecure. What will happen to me? I seem to find a security with my own, in my own notions. That's why I'm holding on to them. What is meant by ego is nothing but holding on to one's notions. From which one finds some kind of a false sense of security. And so, it is a matter of just letting go. When you know that, letting go, when you let go these things, you're not losing anything, you're gaining yourself. And when you finally let go, this notion that I'm an experiencer, then you are totally what you are. If this becomes clear then, this is how I will want to lead my life. Then my life will become a life of yoga. Sinishchena yoktavya This yoga must be pursued. There must be perseverance. There must be a conviction. And there must be a perseverance. Anirvinna chedasa Because Lord Krishna says it is possible that you may not meet with success because you see our mind is a utilitarian mind and always wants success. And in this 20th, 21st century we want quick results for everything. Everything is instant. So if somebody promises moksha in 3 days or 30 days or something like that then you know you can give packages and then people will, will flock around that. It may be in three days. Nobody says it cannot be 30 days. It can be three days, 30 days, three years, 30 years, three lifetimes, 30 lifetimes. You do not know. But as long as there is conviction that what I am seeking is nothing to be myself. In fact, I am not seeking anything other than myself. What I am seeking is recognition of myself and just being myself. And that is why Letting go of those things that are denying myself. That I should stop denying myself, disowning myself. So whatever makes me disown myself, all my various notions, that's all I have to let go. And whenever it happens, it is all right with me. Anirvinna Chetasara, one does not get depressed, one does not get discouraged, one does not get uh, disappointed. So Lord Krishna says perseverance is required. Because after all, certain habits of mind are so strong that it may take a lot of effort to change the habits. All that is necessary here is to change the habits of mind. First of all, change our perception in the intellect and secondly, change the habits of mind. Therefore, listening to Vedanta gives us the right perception and then practice of yoga helps us completely change the habit. And you should do this. Anirvinna Chayasa. And to, it is here, a story is being told, which I told earlier, but I'll repeat here. A story is being told as to how when you persevere with anything, what looks like an impossible goal also can be accomplished. When, is pers- when there is determination and perseverance. So they tell the story. In fact, in a text called Mandukya Karika, Gaudabhadacharya refers to this. He mentioned this. Utseka udadheryadvat kushagreneka minduna manaso nigrastadvat bhaved aparikhedataha Utseka udadheryadvat Just as the whole ocean was emptied. Kushagraneka minduna by drop by drop. Somebody in fact started to empty the whole ocean drop by drop. There was one bird, a small bird, a tittari bird or partridge. This bird apparently it is said laid its eggs, it was it laid its eggs at the at the uh, you know at the seashore. And, you know, ocean being what it is, the rising tides came and the ocean took away those eggs. When the bird returned, it found that there are no eggs. He did not give up. He said, I will somehow retry my eggs. How will he do that? I will empty this ocean, this little bird says. And he started that effort. 
It flew, took a drop, emptied. Take a drop, empty. Drop by drop. Other birds told you, you are stupid, what are you doing? This can never work. You are trying to empty the ocean with your little beak? Drop by drop. He says, I will do it. If not in this life, next life, I will do it anyhow. It persisted. So out of sympathy for him, other birds also joined him. You know, out of compassion, sympathy for him. So they all started trying to empty the ocean, drop by drop. What the birds can do? So you can imagine that scene, what must be going on there. And says, Narada happened to walk by. He saw, I said, what's going on here? And then they told him, look at, what are you doing, fellows? So we're trying to empty the ocean. He says, why? We don't know, but this is what that fellow wants. So Narada went to that bird. So what are you trying to do? I want to empty the ocean. Why? My, my legs have been taken away by this ocean. I'm going to empty it. I'm going to dry it up and recover my eggs. You can't do that. I'm going to do it. So even Sage Narada tried to reason with that bird. He refused. Continue. So then Narada went away from there and went to Garuda. Garuda is eagle. That's the king of all the birds. And Sage Narada told Garuda, you know what's happening there? You know what ocean is doing to your subjects? Because all the birds are the, the subjects. You know, they are the... And so Garuda is a king. You know what ocean is doing to all your uh, birds? He is harassing them. He has taken away the, the eggs. And see, he is, he is causing pain to them. You should do something about it. Because you are the king. That's how, say, Narada was able to incite Garuda. So Garuda goes there. And sees all these birds industriously trying to dry up the ocean. And Garuda got angry at the ocean. And then it started to, you know, it's, it's, Kuruda has huge wings. And it started to flutter the wings. As it started doing that, the ocean started drying up. Now ocean thought that, hey, I am in danger now. If I do not yield, I will be dried up by this Garuda. Therefore, ocean, in all humility, brought those eggs and put them on the, on the seashore. That is how that little bird persisted. This is an example quoted for perseverance. Then the yogi says, the spirit says, if not in this life, next life. I'm going to try, I'm going to continue, persist. Doesn't work out and they happen, this doesn't matter. Next life. Not next life. Asmin Janmani, Janmantareva, whether in this life or any other life, but I'm going to do this. Because there's nothing else to do. The point is, if there was a choice, if you could do something else, then it's all right. But then, in order for me to be happy, the only way I can be happy is when I am myself. Even today also, a real experience, a moment of happiness that we have, when something very desirable happens, and I find myself extremely happy, at that time also, I am brought back to myself. That time also, in fact, all, everything drops off. Sometimes, when I, in the moment when I forget myself, even the sense of doership or the experience, it drops off. So what we call an experience of happiness is nothing but coming to myself. Since I do not recognize, I think that it is that thing that made me happy. In fact, that thing made me to come to myself. So any time I experience happiness, it is happiness of myself from nothing else. That's what Vedanta teaches. That's how the conviction comes. And therefore, this is all that we have to do. There's no other choice. I cannot run away from myself and expect to be happy because running away from myself is running away from happiness. I cannot chase happiness because I can chase happiness only when I deny myself. It's like the tenth man chasing the tenth man. You can never find him. Therefore, this conviction becomes very important. What the fundamental problem is, that conviction is very important. And then alone, there is a fundamental solution. I work for fundamental solution. Otherwise, you keep on trying the symptomatic solutions. And things seem to work for a while, and again, I am back to square one. 
सो लॉर्ड कृष्णा दिस स निश्चय योगतव्य है स योग है दिस योग ऑफ डिसोसिएशन विथ फेन मस्ट बी परस्यूड विथ डिटर्मिनेशन विथ कन्विक्शन अनिर्मिचेत सा विदाउट बींग डिस्करेज विदाउट बींग डिसअपॉइंटेड वन मस्ट परस्यू दिस In next few verses, Lord Krishna again will describe how to do that. We'll see that tomorrow. <clears throat> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamada Ya Purnameva Vasishade Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्रभाष्यकृत वंदे भगवतन पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योम व्याप्तहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम शांति 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 हरि ओ श्री गुरुभ्यो